You are now listening to the Performance Physical Therapy Better Faster Podcast. Today's host is Dr. Michelle Colley, CEO of Performance Physical Therapy. Today's guest is Dr. John Servian, orthopedic surgeon and spine specialist at University Orthopedics. Welcome everyone. I'm here for our next episode in this COVID series. And I am here with Dr. Serbian from University Orthopedics. He is also the Chief of Orthopedics at Landmark Medical Center, a specialist in the adult spine and spinal deformity. Dr. Serbian, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, the nice thing is I notice, and I'm not sure if everyone can see you, but you're actually in scrubs. So it tells me that you're starting to get back to some kind of normalcy um, since the pandemic started over two months ago. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're fortunate that we have uh, the Kettle Point Ambulatory Center where we've tried, you know, we pretty much stay open throughout the whole pandemic. We had a short period we were closed, but because it's same day surgery and the point and the patients go home the same day, we've been op- operating throughout the pandemic. Um, the Department of Health, et cetera, has urged us to stay open as long as there were no, uh, you know, issues, et cetera, because we were able to care for patients that were in extreme pain and that needed, I would say, semi-urgent mm-hmm. surgery. So mm-hmm. from a spine standpoint, uh, I was fortunate enough to to operate pretty much through this pandemic, letting patients go home the same day. And uh, and, and that's where I was today at Kettle Point. And, uh, and it's, it's a safe environment in the sense that there's no inpatients that have COVID and uh, the exposure risk is very low. The, uh, the facility is, is terminally cleaned every day. We test patients preoperatively for COVID and um, the, the physicians and the employees are screened every day also for, you know, symptoms, fever, et cetera. So that's, that's been very advantageous for our patient population that, that fits into that treatment plan or protocol that can go home the same day. It's actually nice to hear that, and it certainly shows you what the benefit is of the surgery centers and the same-day surgeries, and makes sense to keep healthy people who are in pain but need interventions away from the hospitals where the sick people are. Absolutely, absolutely, and and like you mentioned, that's that's a select few patients that are generally healthy that meet certain criteria that quote unquote qualify for surgery at the surgery center based on the type of surgery they need mm-hmm. and, uh, and they can get home and recover in their own house or home, which, uh, you know, is really, I think what everybody would prefer to do if possible. Yeah. So obviously there have been many changes that have gone on through the pandemic, which of course people are still in pain and, and obviously those in a significant amount of pain you've been able to manage and take care of. What about the others? What about the more, day-to-day patients that may be not an extreme need, um, how have you managed their care over the pandemic? Well, obviously, um, having a spine practice, uh, like you alluded to, there are, there are we have a, a large volume of patients that are treated conservatively with medications, cortisone injections, you know, routine appointments, and that, that might not be surgical candidates at this point or ever for that matter. And, uh, and that, that was uh, somewhat challenging, but, you know, fortunately everything happened so quickly, but we, we adapted relatively quickly between myself and my staff, um, utilizing telehealth, you know, that, that right off the bat was, was very important because we were able to communicate with patients that we know, Right. That's 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 the key with telehealth. I think these aren't new patients. These are patients that are well established that we have been treating for years, potentially. And we're able to communicate with them, get an idea of where they're at medi- uh, uh, pain wise. If they needed any medication refills, we could handle that via telehealth and um, and also potentially set them up for other treatments. Um, you know, cortisone injections. I, I do a a fair share of cortisone injections. Basically what we did is we uh, ratcheted down the number of injections we were doing, picking and choosing patients that couldn't wait, that were in severe pain, spacing out the appointments to keep a safer environment, following all the protocols of face masks, washing our hands continuously, et cetera, to make the office um, as, uh, as safe as possible. And treating those patients kind of on a case-by-case basis. 
So let's talk about telehealth a little bit. And obviously, it's something we all had to suddenly figure out how to do very quickly. And it's I'm grateful that we had that opportunity to do that. Do you think telehealth will continue to be something part of your practice and the way that you manage your patients? Yeah, I, I think it will be. Um, I think it'll obviously be driven by people that'll make the decision whether or not specialists can use telehealth once this pandemic ends. Um, let's say that we will have that option. Then I think there are a certain subset of patients that we definitely could treat via telehealth. Um, either these patients that are well known to us that, you know, we kind of know where they stand from a physical exam standpoint, et cetera, or patients that can't go out, right. There's always that set of patients that are challenging to get rides that are physically not, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging just to go to a doctor's, uh, to the doctor's visit. Um, I think it can be utilized for those patients. And then it's just a matter of kind of, from our standpoint of, and a staffing standpoint of where do we, where do we fit those patients in? Do we do them on one particular day? Do we put them in with patients that are coming to the office? It's kind of that balance that we need to find also. But there are definitely advantages to it, no doubt. Yes, it's nice to have as an adjunct, I think, and it allows us to provide that ongoing access to care. It certainly doesn't replace in person, um, just like doing a podcast. It's not as fun to do on a Zoom call rather than in person, but um, it's nice to it's a nice way to give that access to care and certainly better than nothing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it was, you know, it was imperative that we, that we transitioned over to telehealth for all the specialists, for the physical therapist, et cetera, so that we could continue care, you know, it's been a couple of months, right? So very important. So we're transitioning now in Rhode Island to a time when we're really learning to live with COVID in our communities, and that includes helping our patients navigate the healthcare system. And I'm sure as you're, just like we are, I'm sure you're the same, that there's still many people who are fearful or concerned about going out into the public or seeking services or seeking help. Um, What messages would you want to give patients out there, people who are in pain, about the risks of coming, but also the risks and what happens if they don't get the help that they need? Yeah, so it's it's a delicate balance. So, you know, one side of it is obviously the information they receive. There's a lot of information out there. And that's, you know, it's critical that they look to the proper source for accurate information as far as, you know, the, the COVID and the disease is concerned. And then I think they have to, and based on what we know, it looks like this disease is definitely, we can see that it affects a certain subset population more significantly than others. So right off the bat, you have to, you have to see if you're one of those high risk patients, if you're more elderly, if you're immunocompromised, right? You have these other comorbidities. If that's the case, then you need to take additional steps to limit your, um, you know, your time out or, you know, the risks you're going to take and where you're going to travel. Now, that being said, I think, you know, what I would recommend to a patient is if you're going to go and see a physician, you know, whether it be orthopedic, et cetera, have a conversation with their staff in the office or the physician themselves and kind of get a feel for when you come in, what the experience will be. Um, You know, speaking from our office, you know, some of the, uh, the protocols and methods that we've used, we have, again, spaced out appointments. We're limiting the people in the office so that they can be distanced in the office. Everybody wears face masks all the time in the office, employees, physicians, as well as other patients, right? Constant washing of hands. Uh, after every patient is seen in a room, the room is being cleaned by our medical assistants. So we're taking every step possible. And then, of course, there's the screening that's happening. There's not only screening of the employees and the physicians when they come in in the morning, but also screening of every patient that comes in, a set of questions. And if there's any concern that, you know, in the past that they've traveled out of state, I know that restriction was just lifted. Or if there's any other symptoms, then we're asking them to come back. Um, unless it's, you know, it's a, you know, really, if it's anything more serious, they could always go to the emergency room. So we're taking all these steps. And I think those steps being in place, if you're in a lot of pain, I think you should come in and be seen. I mean, it's, it's especially now we're at a point where the the quote unquote surge, the numbers seem to be going down. I think we're heading in the right direction and the pain 
can be, you know, like they say the curse can be just as bad as the disease, right? So we're dealing with COVID, but on the same token, on the other side, patients are sick, patients have pain, patients need to be treated. You know, it's in a risk benefit balance that you have to find. Um, and I think the patient, you know, kind of knows where they stand. Um, I've seen it in my practice I and mean, I have a lot of patients that have a lot of pain and they've come in for their cortisone injections. They've come in to be treated. We've done lots of surgeries of patients that are just not able to tolerate the pain that are, you know, that are suffering at home. Well, you make great points and it is about that balance of risk and, and realizing that you, that staying at home and being in significant pain is only going to have downstream consequences to turning to opioids, affecting your sleep, impacting your quality of life, and mental health challenges with that. Like there's so many ramifications to not getting the help that you need. So elective surgeries, I, I understand, are starting to happen again and, and moving forward. But obviously there was probably many that were canceled or put on hold. How do you see yourself managing this in the months to come? And just say, and before I get into that, just to follow up on what you said earlier. Yeah. So that's, that's the other side of it, right? So people have been quarantined, they're in pain and it's just a, you know, it's, it's just a perfect storm of you know, being quarantined and your mental health can deteriorate and you're in more pain, which affects your mental health. So I, I think it's very important to get out and get treated. There's no doubt about, it. um, yeah, we've had a, a significant backlog of elective surgeries. So finally we're starting to book these patients for surgery and uh, head in that direction. Um, basically, we're, we're just looking at all the patients that need surgery. We're trying to not only have a discussion with each patient, but also sort of trying to categorize them based on, you know, the need of, and the urgency, patients in more significant pain that have been holding on, um, patients that can be uh, that, that maybe a smaller surgery that they'll go home in a day or two. Um, versus something larger that maybe can be wait a little longer where they might be in the hospital. You know, this is specific to spine surgery. They might have four or five plus days in the hospital. Um, that's kind of where we're at, and we're just chipping away at this point trying to catch up. Again, we do have restrictions at the hospital, how many we can do, et cetera. So we're doing the best we can. I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of surgery that surgeries that you do do. I mean, there's lots, there's a whole variety, but just to help our listeners understand what kind of different spine surgeries that you're involved with doing. Okay. So yeah, well, I mean, we'll start with the basics. So that let's let's look at the patients that we do that can go home the same day, right? Some of these smaller surgeries. I mean, I do the whole spine, a lot of cervical spine, the neck lower back or lumbar spine, and then there's a, a certain subset of that middle spine, thoracic spine. They're not as common. So the back and the neck, one-level surgeries, maybe one-level fusion in the neck, a one-level little disc discectomy, right, microdiscectomy in the lower back. Um, those types of cases we've been able to do, they can be done at the surgery center or even at the hospital if need be, and they can go home the same day. Um, then we kind of bump it up to the next level where we're doing multi-level fusions. Right. So two, three levels in the neck, two or three levels in the lower back. Um, and again, most of these surgeries are for disc herniations or uh, degenerative arthritis, spinal stenosis. Right. That's formed narrowing around the nerves and around the, the spinal cord. Um, and those surgeries, as they get bad, bigger, are multiple levels. So there's potentially screws, rods in the lower back. There's a plate in the neck. And, and those surgeries are more likely to stay overnight, at least one day, if not two or three days in the hospital. Um, and then there's everything in between. Then you, you know, you can get into much larger surgeries that are, uh, you know, very long four to six hour surgeries. And that's, that's just next level deformity type surgery. And, and those require even more care postoperatively. Well, it's a complicated, but exciting part of the body, the spine, because it has a lot of functions to protect the spinal cord, yet to hold us upright and keep us mobile and a lot of things. So admire your craftsmanship when it comes to operating on the spine, because it obviously takes a lot of key detail and, and a keen eye and um, a lot of accuracy. So it's, it's a stressful time for everyone at the moment, and we've already did mention that stress impacts your ability, your body's ability to manage pain. When you speak to your patients or work with your patients, what recommendations do you give them of, of how to manage 
themselves mentally and physically to keep healthy and and all all which will help their healing and help with the management of pain. Yeah, so I, I mean, the, the challenge always is is, is pain is is very subjective, right? And it's difficult to appreciate each patient and how much pain they're experiencing. Um, and I and that's why I always sort of when we start to discuss particularly physical activity is they have to listen to their body and that's going to kind of guide them on what they can do and what they can't do. I always urge patients that be in motion, right? Get up, move around, do as much as you can and find those activities that don't make your pain worse, don't aggravate your underlying back pain, neck pain, et cetera. They know better than anybody to some degree because they are experiencing the pain. We obviously will get guidance from physical therapy, et cetera, through this process. And that's one side of it from a physical standpoint. In a lot of these patients, again, like I mentioned, they've had physical therapy on us. So they hopefully have a baseline of exercises and and different uh, home activities that they can do. Um, And then the other side is, you know, from a mental standpoint, I mean, you know, I'm a strong proponent of that side of things. Um, Again, that's. Right off the bat, and very important, as, as much as you can, I want patients to hopefully not be in too much pain where they can't sleep. Sleep is just vital. It's vital to them uh, recovering from any treatments they've received from us. It's, it's just vital for you know well-being in general. And, and the more we study sleep, the more we realize that. Um, and then the other side from a mental health standpoint is you know finding something at at home. I mean, right now it's this COVID crisis. So most of it's happening at home and just where you can be at a little bit of peace, you know, get outside as much as you can for those that like to do um, alternative methods of treatment, yoga, meditation, et cetera. Those can be be extremely helpful, not only in your mental health and well-being, but also with the management of pain. Um, It's, you know, it's, it's kind of taking everything together and and, uh, and it's tough. It's tough to find the time. It's tough to be disciplined to do that. But uh, now is as good of time as ever because I think some of us have more time on our hands. Well, I, you lo- used a, one of my favorite words when it comes to managing your pain, and that is discipline, And which means it's really, and I think using the word discipline helps people think that it's actually really hard to manage pain. It, it means you've got to think about your sleep, your exercise, um, your stress levels, you know, how long you're sitting for and, and even your diet. So, and it takes a lot of hard work and discipline to be able to manage all of these things that can have a major impact on how much pain you're, you're in and then your impact to have a good quality of life. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, it's hard work. It's not easy. It's not, as, it's not as simple as saying, just take a pill and your pain will go away. Like to really manage pain, it's really hard work, but it's Absolutely. worth it. It's worth it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a decision you have to make. Um, Surgeries, you know, and the right patient can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. However, you know, like you alluded to, the long term success of any type of treatment is Mm -hmm. just looking at your body as a whole and incorporating in exercise, diet, sleep, et cetera. It's all going to play into it. it. And that's that's a message that uh, unfortunately patients don't always uh, get. Right, or completely understand. But again, it's hard work. Everybody wants a quick fix. <laughs> yep. You know, and there's not really any such thing as a quick fix. So, yes, yeah, so you see it as a surgeon. I'm sure you have plenty of people walk in and say, I just want this pain gone. But yeah. you, you can fix the structural things, but all the other things contributing to it, it's a, it's a team approach. Absolutely. And you can predict the motivated patients that want to get better. You see it. You know, you see it uh, subjectively. They, they seem to get better quicker. and because they do what they need to do. Yep, yep, absolutely. So during this COVID pandemic, um, you know, I'm sure you've had to learn, you've had to be resilient. You've had to suddenly treat patients in different ways. Um, Have you learned anything that will help you, make you be an even better doctor? Um, Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, uh, like any time you look through history of crisis, I mean, things, you need to adapt quickly, you know, And, and there's always a certain level of learning that and discovery that occurs with this. Um, You you look at world wars, et cetera, the, you know, the discoveries during surgery and and stuff that, you know, and situations that you're presented with that you've never been presented with before. Right. And this is very similar, this COVID crisis. It's, 
you know, it's it's maybe not as extreme, but there were surgeons that learned so much during wartime and war surgery, et cetera. It's, it's an analogy where this is a situation where we've needed to adapt quickly. And um, and I think we have. I think, you know, the, the, the one lesson that I learned is, you know, you can work as a team and adapt by working hard, getting to that in um and, uh, and getting to that place, you know, we all have in the healthcare industry, I mean, even outside of the healthcare industry, work together to, you know, to, uh, to better the, the well-being of everybody. Um, and I think that, you know, going forward will help me. I mean, you become a little more understanding, you become a little more patient um, as a doctor, you know, and uh, you find a little more balance. I think, uh, you know, there's been there's plenty of positive that's come out of this you know, that's allowed us to kind of, uh, kind of sit back and reflect a little bit versus just head down going, you know, hundred miles an hour, which we all do, you know, when, um, hopefully as things ramp up, we kind of can, can look back on that yeah. and learn from that. Which that's all of our hope is that we can find the good in all of this ultimately and learn from it and be better and kinder and a little more balanced almost this time of reinvention there's an interesting article that I was just reading and you've got this whole these phases of rebooting and and you know getting back to where we were but it's almost reinventing now's the time that we can really look at how we live and how we work and how we treat each other and sort of say all right how are we gonna what's the new normal gonna be like yeah I mean I I I can't uh, speak to how many people I've I've spoken to or even myself that you know was like this is kind of nice with you know a little rest Right. Everybody's a lot of people have been there. This has been kind of nice. We've had a little bit of a rest for better or worse. Yeah. You know, and I, and as, as you get busier, some people are going to miss it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, let's face it because, you know, we're all, you know, so many of us are just, you know, going so fast in the lifestyle. Yeah. I got to say, I, I was, I shouldn't, shouldn't say this out loud, but you know, I have two teenage kids. And so I, I haven't missed the running around all weekend, driving them to sporting events and dealing yeah. with all of that. I mean, I look forward to being part of those things again, but it's been a nice little vacation Absolutely. for all of that. Nice yep. little vacation. So got, any, no, I was going to say, I got two teenage daughters and then I've got two younger boys, four, and I just had a three month old boy. Oh so my goodness. Actually, yeah, so it's been kind of nice because that's definitely been some more quality time at home, and to have the teenage daughters around, probably just like your teenage kids. I mean, yep. it's nice to have them around. They're a little, and they almost forced to kind of speak to us for a little bit. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I get home from work, and I'm like, my teenagers actually want to speak to me, and maybe because they're bored out of their mind. But I'm like, this is pretty good. <laughs> but on the same token, they need to get out and social. Uh, yeah, it, they need to. It's they really, need I, I feel to bad. It really caught up to them. Yeah. I didn't realize that I was a little naive, but it was really bothering not seeing their friends. I mean, that's their life, right, at this age? Yeah. Absolutely so. Yeah. I, no, you're right. It, it, it seems there's, there's little highlights of it, but, but they need to be teenagers as well. Absolutely. So, so any good. final words of wisdom for our community um, as we continue to go through this challenging time that you'd like to sign off with? I mean, nothing in particular. I mean, I think just, uh, you know, continue to adapt, continue to uh, – be resilient and, um, and, you know, just to continue to communicate um, with everybody within the community. And from a healthcare standpoint, you know, I think at this point, you know, reach out to your physicians or your PAs, et cetera, whoever's treating you and, and, you know, feel comfortable going in to see them if you're in pain or if you're in need of medical treatment, because I, I think in general, the healthcare community is trying as hard as they are to provide a safe environment yeah. for patients to be seen. And, um, get back to as close to normal as we can or whatever this new normal will be. And I think that's a great point for all the healthcare providers. You know, we know how to clean and wear masks and be super diligent with the cleaning. So um, mm-hmm. your healthcare facilities are probably some of the safe. They're a lot safer than going to the Absolutely. supermarket. So I, you know, not that's that I want to go to the supermarket, but you know, that's what I, that's what I always said. I mean, you're, you're, you're safer there than going out to so different places. So exactly. It's good. exactly. Well, Dr. Servian, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's nice to see you in scrubs and getting back into the operating room and providing care for the patients in our community. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Performance Physical Therapy Better Faster Podcast. 